So thank you for joining today. Hare Krishna. Uh, thank you. As I was thinking we could discuss today on the topic of social justice and spiritual wisdom. And um, we could talk about this in broadly three topics, uh, three sections. What is uh, right about social justice and where the drive for social justice sometimes can become deficient and how spiritual wisdom can complement it. Okay. So <clears throat> now the word social justice is different from just justice or individual justice. Normally we may use the word justice in the sense that if somebody has done something wrong to me and I get some reparations from a court or uh, so that would be specifically for justice. We talk about just in the sense that there is a, a verdict that comes out or a system that is there is fair. If I want to go to university, there's no discrimination against me to get admission in the university. Now, social justice holds the idea that uh, individually, sometimes people cannot get what they deserve, even if they try as much as they as much as they try, if the system itself is rigged against them. And social justice in one sense is uh, strongly opposed to the Western idea of meritocracy, where the idea is that if you work hard, then you will succeed. But here the idea is that racks to riches stories are there, but social justice holds that they are so rare as to not be relevant for most people. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, rags to riches stories are often touted uh, so that any system, systemic change is avoided. That, so that means if somebody is born in poverty, somebody is born in a locality where there is high crime and there is a low education available, then if you work hard enough, you will succeed. So the endeavor is left primarily on the individual. And social justice holds that this is unfair to the individual because sometimes even with your best efforts, if society is unfair and rigged against you, then you will never succeed. So there, it will be almost impossible for you to succeed. And that's why so the idea is we need to do some social engineering. Society itself has to be modified at a collective level. And often it is at the level of uh, political change done by the government so that justice can be established. Okay. Yeah. Any thoughts on this? <clears throat> uh, is this connected with uh, the Greek thinkers and their idea of like, I mean, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, how things should be governed, how a city should be organized, how there should be opportunities for everyone to express themselves is it something to do with that particular soil of thought uh, yes partially but in some ways uh, i think uh, plato's republic was the primary book for western administrative systems and many things have evolved from there uh, in general in modern time social justice uh, has uh, arisen from uh, Marxist ideology. Social justice is often associated with socialism, which is a milder form of Marxism. Marxism. So Marxism had the idea that now Marxism, communism, socialism, they're somewhat different. Marx was more the political theorist. Communism was what was implemented. And many people say that it was a misrepresentation or misapplication of what uh, Marx taught and then there is socialism which is still considered widely appealing so the idea that there are the world is divided to hierarchies there are haves and have nots there are the wealthy the powerful the influential and there are the deprived so society is arranged this way and that needs to be fixed and uh, so broadly it's more from a uh, political left side of uh, uh, of the communism and that kind of ideology from what I understand. Okay. Uh, maybe you can go forward 
so that uh, when we come to the point where we okay for vedic solutions we can compare that with the situation in india that's true yes okay so now in social justice <clears throat> while um if while certain the facts of social justice are true that uh, it's not always possible for an individual to uh, fight against the whole system and rise so there is this um, uh this one thinker who is who gives a thought experiment he says that suppose before you were born you had the facility to wander around the earth in outer space and choose where would you like to be born in which family which country which society uh, so what would you want and are there certain places certain settings which you would not want to be born in then this is that is where it's indicative that some amount of social justice is needed that there is discrimination in so there is disparity in society and that needs to be fixed so we might want to be born in a place where broadly uh, there is good education there is a good med medication there is good system of justice and there is an overall possibility for growing in your career and in your life so are there places where we would not want to be born that that's one thought exercise to drive home the reality that there is disparity and it needs to be fixed so once we feel okay this is where i would not want to be born then oh okay then that means something is wrong over there and that needs to be fixed so that's how we can develop some amount of empathy for this okay. now the, with respect to second point i uh, my understanding is that now it goes wrong in both in its theoretical foundation and its practical application so in practical application if you look at it we do know that the attempts for social engineering led to disaster in in soviet russia and in china in soviet russia especially there were the after the bolshevik revolution all those who were wealthy farmers uh, they were destroyed so many of them were sent to the gulags which were like the gulags which were like the concentration camps in soviet russia and then their wealth and their property was given to the poor people and especially in ukraine there was one of the biggest man made famines in the in the late 1920s because all the wealthy farmers who were they were in some ways hard working they knew how agriculture worked and they knew what to sow and how to manage it they were all either killed or sent to the concentration camps and people who were incompetent they were they were given the wealth and property and they just couldn't manage it so so basically uh, there is uh, the presumption over here that the victims are virtuous that those okay. who are deprived are are good people and they are deprived and those who are successful are bad people they are bad because they must have exploited they must have gamed the system uh, and now this yes there are we could say in human society there are good people and bad people but uh, dostoevsky the prominent russian thinker he said that so that communism draws this line or communism or the idea ideology underlying social justice draws this line very neatly between those who are powerful and those who are powerless that the powerful are good and the powerless are evil however he says this line between good and evil it goes through every human heart and that means that people who are deprived people who are in a difficult situation it could be that it they, they because of their vices they are there and people who are successful and powerful it could be because of certain virtues that they are there by virtues it's not necessarily 
moral ability it's not necessarily morality it could also be simply ability somebody is just good at doing certain things and somebody is not good at doing certain things so uh, so the the suspicion the default suspicion of hierarchy itself could be a problem in social justice just like if you want to cook food and we want to eat we have 10 people in a the house then there might be one or two who are good at cooking and if they are in charge and they tell okay you you cut the vegetables you go and buy this and you do this we say oh, you are the boss you are just sitting here and you are just mixing a few things you are telling everyone to go and go and uh, do all the hard work but no if they are good at it that hierarchy is good for everyone because if the food that is cooked is good everybody will get the good food but if you say let everybody cook equally but then you know not every if there are five people instead of 10 and you're going to cook five items not everybody might be equally good so the default suspicion of hierarchy often makes social justice go over the top in terms of um its implementation the first implementation is let's challenge and destroy all hierarchies and this is permeated and this could be a whole different subject but this has permeated no gender theory where quite often you know, women are portrayed as the victims and men are by default the exploiters this has even permeated into parenting where it is said that parents are sometimes abusive to the children which is true it happens sometimes but the children need guidance and mentoring so the idea of complete coddling of children and almost no disciplining of children because parents are in a powerful position children are in a powerless position so this default suspicion of hierarchy can lead to a completely dysfunctional society and that is what has happened broadly speaking uh, in um, in communist countries where uh, social justice attempts were made at a social societal level and the result was disastrous It is not that uh, by the social engineering alone, society could be brought to a proper state. Rather, it led to discrimination, exploitation, and destruction in a scale that has not been seen otherwise in human history. A hundred million people were killed in the communist uh, governments. And one argument which is given often here is that, oh, it was misimplemented. the problem is that okay that stalin or lenin were people were vicious people but the problem is in this system okay if there if there is even if there is virtuous person that virtuous person could be killed and somebody else who is vicious will come up and if there is ideological justification for the social engineering then it it may often very well go by that person's biases and whims mm. of you know who are to be considered um, the exploiters and who are to be considered the exploited and anybody who is considered to be opposing one could be called as the opposite opponent of the state which is actually out to do good and we see this happening today now often the, those who, are so, who favor social engineering are the le- are people on the left and they are claimed to be liberal they claim themselves to be liberal but often they are extremely illiberal toward anyone who opposes them mm-hmm. and so liberals are illiberal towards anyone who is not liberal so mm-hmm. that is where social justice often goes into a uh, into excesses the effort for social justice can go into excesses any thoughts on this uh, two thoughts one is that uh, this thing that poor are poor because uh, they have done something wrong and uh, we see in the teachings of uh, jesus christ this thing of uh, blessed are the poor so they inherit the kingdom of god there or uh, they are uh, chosen favorites of the lord so this seems to have uh, something of a kind of a uh, point to stabilize society during that time because we just was preaching not to intellectuals not to elite he was preaching to people who were oppressed 
and you need yes. to give them some sort of confidence that uh, what's happening to you is actually not bad you can still rise from uh, this current state that is one point secondly as you told about uh, in china and uh, russia in the previous soviet union how the rich landlords uh, they were called kulaks and kulaks is actually it became a bad word they made an they made every kulak an enemy of the state and enemy of the people so um, something similar was attempted in india but not with force and not with the kajal or not with the ak47 but uh, vinoba bhave tried to dis- try to persuade the hearts of rich landlords that on your own you give something so that you can improve the condition of the poor mm. and it was called the bhudan movement and the slogan was jai jagat so there is something like a movement there is something like a mantra to chant but the jai part was just for the whole planet jai jagat mm. unfortunately or whatever most of the land which was something like um, i don't exactly remember but about 500000 acres were given to these volunteers when they toured all of india they would go they would hold meeting then they would then exhort the rich people that from your heart no force from your heart all they got was barren land was so, barren land donated or yeah barren land donated oh okay so mostly they, that was given to i don't know what kind of uh, disbursement method was devised but practically we don't see we don't it was not a successful experiment at all so point is at the bayo- point of a bayonet this kind of social justice doesn't work and by kind words it doesn't work that's interest i once saw a slogan outside a church you know give god what is right not what is left <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes we give sometimes charity when it is not given wholeheartedly when it is in the what is the 18 17 chapter uh datavyam datavyam iti the third verse over there is that when it is done with resentment and charity yes. is given with resentment then that is charity either in in the mode of passion or ignorance yeah and that doesn't work so that's a good point so if if people's hearts are not really into it they will they it will not work so that is true so one side is that um, in terms of its uh, social excesses you brought that point that uh, so, in some ways social justice movement considers that religion perpetuate social injustice because religion is often an instrument for the status quo to be maintained that you are told if you live a virtuous life then you will have a good life in the future and in in the future world in the next life so you live a good life means that you don't create disruption in society you just do the duties of where you are and whatever role you have in society and marx had the idea that throughout human history injustice unfair systems in society were maintained by this kind of religious justification of existing inequities okay. so for ex- for example the aristocracy what were called the royalty or and there was a royalty royalty and there was the gentry so no, the, the, the the general people were there in in the medieval medieval world so the idea was all those who were aristocrats they practically never worked they would just have their seasons where they would meet potential partners and they would have parties and they would and they would just have their land holdings by which they would get money and they would simply enjoy life so if one was born among the aristocracy then their life was great if one was a lord or a all or whatever uh, but if somebody was born among common people the lot was very difficult 
so this that the social existing social order was a divine dispensation says so by this idea the social injustice was justified and perpetuated and this critique is uh, extended further uh, within the indian context because in the in the indian tradition the idea of reincarnation is accepted and this is their idea that if somebody is born in a deprived condition that is because of what you have done in your past lives so it's because of your karma you are born poor you are born disempowered you are born deprived and you have to live out the way you are so both from the way of future not in this life you can't move but in the next life you can move and if you are here it's unfair so christianity had the idea that it was a divine dispensation but they say hinduism had the idea it's your own karma because of which you are here and either way religion becomes a deterrent for social justice and it becomes a justifier of the unfairness in society so any thoughts on this uh as we were uh, discussing this uh, part of our recording i would uh, classify the religion which marx was against or anybody else as the as that side of organized religion which was corrupted to put it more clearly because we also see and then maybe we'll talk about it in our solution part that there existed at least we see through the pages of vedic text a state where disparity inequality and uh, some people are highly skilled some are not so skilled all existing harmoniously where nobody was a exploiter and nobody was a perpetrator uh, nobody was a victim so that existed it just requires uh, that bit of spiritual training as to how we can do that so the idea that i was born as you talked of the nobility many of them felt that if we bring these people to somewhat better level then who will serve us hmm so any point of equality was always put down very harsh and then like this is the kind of thing where with every passing decade or every passing century the divide became more and more solidified and marx was not alive to see what his teachings have done but through his pen he told the world that unless there is a violent overthrow of the entire system hmm. you cannot have justice because these people are all rotten to the core and they would always look at uh, society this is one thing the vedic texts tell us to see society not through the current lens of just say 21st century or 20th or 19th or 18th we get so many lenses we can use certain certain things certain things cannot be used all the great acharyas have always said that this is good but not practical today so the combination of rigid uh, religion but corrupted by elite and then the social system where some people had to be kept down because otherwise they were they fear that who will who will drive the carriage who will sow the seeds who will uh, uh, cut the harvest and uh, so so this is kind of the, the the no compassion no mercy is also at the heart of the elite behaving like that yes so you know this is a this is a very important point which you made that the the vice that can corrupt uh, corrupt say the powerful the vice that can corrupt the powerless 
which will make them do self destructively say but that same vice can also corrupt people who are within religious hierarchies also and when that happens then that can lead to the abuse of the religious ideas for justifying inequity but if we consider within communism or within social engineering there is no system to itself foster virtue or to or to remove vice and unless that is done so vice could be self cells could be self destructive habits where people are smoking and drinking and uh, things like uh, people are into substance abuse and then that is terrible so no matter how much they are help they cannot actually help themselves because of those self destructive habits so unless there is some way to foster nurture virtue and to remove vice any system can fall apart and i would say that this is where a spiritual wisdom can play a part so i would like to show a, a four point diagram four quadrant diagram is this visible now yes yes now it is visible okay so <clears throat> if there is no social justice and there is no spiritual wisdom then life becomes unbearable because i can see the blatant unfairness that is all there all around me and i think why should i be the victim uh, and it this can lead to violent violent uprising and destructiveness so this is unbearable now we have to get out from there now once you get out where do we go if there is only social engineering that means we bring out social justice but there is no spiritual wisdom then the problem can happen in two ways say in any society there will have to be for functioning some hierarchy even if we, those who are who those are sometimes called as social justice warriors they they uh, for example hold the idea that society needs to be rearranged and who is going to rearrange it well they will rearrange it they have the wisdom they have the maturity they have the compassion and what happens inevitably they become powerful and everybody else becomes powerless so this is unsustainable i'll talk about each of these later but briefly and you can also add in this that sometimes those who become powerful in doing social engineering they might develop vices or they might be succeeded by someone who have concealed their vice till now and then they can brutally exploit society on the other hand uh, so through social engineering alone if the people in general who are benefited it may well happen that uh, somebody instead of they were poor why were they poor because they uh, I mean, they they doing substance abuse and they were not able to hold a job, and then you you say that okay you will get money from the government as welfare because you have life has been unjust to you, but then they might just live like that and not actually do anything to improve their lot. So from both ways it could be unsustainable, and this could be there could be a critique of this which could be discussed. Now spiritual wisdom yeah. with social justice. it at least makes life bearable why bearable okay that even if we consider just the christian world view that okay there is a better future for me if not in this life in the next life so i can accept my lot and uh, from what i have read about medieval times although there was the blatant blatant huge difference between say the nobility and the uh, general people but it is not that say if there was a lord who had a butler that the butler and the servants they do not they were constantly resentful and envious they accepted their place in society and they were relatively they were able to live that way now if we consider the vedic perspective of there is a previous life also so rather than only considering that by way of previous life you are born into certain level of poverty and certain level of wealth 
but that sense of karma can give us some acceptance of it now the, yeah. i would like to differentiate between acceptance and passivity or acceptance and resignation that this is uh, how it is i accept it now this is how i am meant to for the rest of my life that would be resignation and that is unhealthy but at least spiritual wisdom has the virtue of uh, has the strength of making one's condition bearable hmm? yeah but uh, now if we had both spiritual wisdom and social justice together that would be sustainable in the sense that people wouldn't just be focusing on social engineering but we could say also on spiritual engineering spiritual engineering means that you act everybody actively works to cultivate vice and to curb virtue in their own sorry to cultivate virtue and curb vice in their own hearts both the powerful and both the um, empowered and the disempowered and then society can be more uh, society can be transformed and sustained both so i just want to add a small point here that the sustainable thing basically we talk of power we talk of privileges when the lower echelons of society they, they don't have power therefore there is resentment and there is animosity or there could be outright a uh, revolutionary attitude when when this class or these classes they see that somebody in the upper echelon in two scenarios scenario 1 they exhibit the power and that power is visible that power is palpable as it, it it can be felt so it is not like people want to do away with power but actually they want it for themselves because the whole idea is unless i have power i won't be happy unless i have power i won't be creative i won't be satisfied so when they see a voluntarily giving up of the power and privileges by the elite at a proper time so they come to know that this power and privilege doesn't define this person and i can't see any more example any better example than the behavior of a spiritually evolved personality like in my small experience what i hear about prabhupad but i can say that for about any uh, spiritually evolved person for example one hong kong uh, incident where the devotees were not very financially resourceful but they still took on rent a suite at a very uh, expensive on the last floor of a skyscraper hotel and the reporter came and they started talking questions about who are you what are you doing what is the purpose of your spiritual movement and after a few questions few pleasantries he came to the main thing which he had in his mind that is a look we are talking of spirituality and education and everything and we are sitting in this plush suite of a skyscraper hotel and prabhupad was quick to reward that i can have this dialogue in a open field in india but are you willing to come there hmm beautiful so so the point is uh someone spiritually evolved is finally focused on the transmission of the message the transmission of uh, you talked about spiritual wisdom so when somebody is focused only on the wisdom part then they may use power use financial resources use privilege to be accessible to whoever they want to and if that purpose is not served they are willing to give it up relinquish it so like we have uh, the french revolution equality liberty and fraternity hmm egalite egalitarian comes from the french word egalite so how to dispense social justice or well there was not that term at that time but how to dispense justice at least do away with the nobility all the crooks all the people who have amassed wealth in our expenditure expense do away with them 
how do you shoot so many hundreds and thousands or how do you kill them in a way that it will be it will mark a kind of a it will it will it will make a big impact so the guillotine was invented the name of the pill was also guillotine and the, the instrument also was called the guillotine it stopped only with the head of the revolution robespierre that only when he was finally guillotined that thing stopped so initially it was known criminals then it was unknown criminals then it became anyone uh, who's any connection any connection with nobility so, so this this kind of thing the world has seen that uh, those who claim power on the basis of injustice meted out to them grab that power and exhibit the same arrogance whom they were fighting who, which were they fighting yeah that's a very powerful example of french revolution because it led to indiscriminate bloodshed and somehow that lesson was not learned in some ways by history and that was repeated so the french revolution probably the unrest was there for maybe 10 15 years and napoleon napoleon bonaparte came up after that yeah and again in some sense there was hierarchy but napoleon bonaparte recognized the cause underlying the the french revolution and then he tried to although he was the king and in some ways his system was uh, his system was similar to the earlier system but he tried to institute meritocracy that it's not that by birth you will become a uh, become a lord or a commander or a leader in my government you can do it by merit also mm. so some kind of but now that same thing was tried for 60 70 years after the bolshevik revolution in russia and china and i think you quoted was it gorbachev who said that this should have been done in a small area before yeah i told you about that it was yeah, boris yeltsin the so first yeltsin, uh, okay. yeah first of russia after. right yeltsin okay so now this uh, this is a very uh, so when you mentioned about uh, the willingness to give up power if required yeah that will come only when there is an understanding that there is some gain greater than power some gain greater than power some gain greater than worldly power or worldly pleasure and that is where spiritual wisdom is required so without spiritual wisdom uh, the sooner or later the lure of power can become become irresistible and even if say there's one there could be people who say who seek social justice right now and they they might be genuinely compassionate uh, uh, that they genuinely want a change in society however the problem is that not everybody is like that and sooner or later when that power comes up that power will be taken over so one place i two two thoughts and that one is that in some ways social justice and social engineering tries to get the state to play god the state yeah. frederick nietzsche he had this idea that uh, when the death of god happened or he said it has happened that god is dead now in the sense that there is no rational basis for accepting the idea of god he said as a result of this two things may happen one is obsessive individualism or totalitarianism so if there is no god then either i i become god and i decide whatever i want to do i'll do it or the state will become god some kind of totalitarian regime will come up so to some extent when the idea of meritocracy is taken to its extreme it is like i am the determiner of my destiny so basically i am god and i can make the world the way i want it to be and communi- so now if we can broadly associate meritocracy with capitalism then the opposite of meritocracy is society is unmeritocracy you say it's unfair so then communism has the idea that the state will be god 
and the state will rearrange everything in such a way that that is everything is benevolently and equitably arranged but the problem is that if someone tries to be god it all it's extremely high probability that basically they will end up becoming the devil yeah because that power can corrupt corrupt uh, in a very dangerous way so when we think that we can shape people's destinies that oh that means the idea is uh, the way the world is it's unfair and if we say it is because of god we will change it either i am god that is meritocracy or the state is god that is uh, that is uh, that is social engineering so the so either way the key thing is yes society has to be changed there is injustice and definitely uh, there is unfairness and there is exploitation that has to be corrected at the same time it is god whose presence in the heart the invocation of genuine spirituality that can actually transform the heart and then there can be virtue and when virtue is fostered within the heart that's when uh, the social justice can be sustained so if we have spiritual leaders who who manifest virtue and who inspire others to manifest virtue then that is something which can take social justice to a level that is sustainable otherwise it will be basic it will be problematic it will will create a revolution as we say that there's a resolution revolution dissolution but no solution prabhupad would say that so any any thoughts on this uh, this thought came about uh, like long ago one student told me that uh, isn't krishna ashamed of saying so many big big high celebrating things about himself in the gita like i have never seen somebody without being embarrassed talking about himself in such a blatant way mm. so i tried to explain but of course uh, he was not that satisfied so no many times many times it happened so once i was talking and i said do you know that in the rajasriya sacrifice whose job was to wash the feet of every guest who came in the pavilion and the person said no i don't know I said Krishna did that. So he said so. I said what do you mean so? Normally, somebody who is accused of being full of himself, as they say, also has the the courage or the willingness to give up that power all the time and do such a simple menial thing like uh, wash the feet of everybody who is coming uh, to visit the Rajya sacrifice. now since this is our kali yuga age we also have machiavelli our italian philosopher friend yeah. who would say that in case you want to have that power sometimes you should show that you are willing to relinquish it just to pacify the masses in your heart you have no desire to do that so Uh, there are a few countries where they are under totalitarian regimes and the dictator every two or three years he says i think i should resign and then the whole cabinet were nothing but his stooges they all make a whole melodramatic performance saying no please don't you are the father of the nation you are this you are that and then he says all right if you insist i'll stay on <laughs> oh god so so not only like we see jenghis khan or taimur or atila the hun these people could be tyrants like being a tyrant is their 24 by 7 job hmm. they never have any humility they have never shown any humility what is more dangerous is the apparent show of humility where you in the the intent of latching on to power is still there so for a common person like i would say from my own point of view 
I am attracted to pomp and luxury and celebration. So the Soviet Union, what they would have is they would divert the attention of people into sports. And then they would tell the world that because we earn so many medals, therefore there is justice. People are happy. Everybody is contented. Otherwise, how can you have such physically fit people? Look at our sports record. It, it says for itself. We are superior. We are breeding a superior race of human beings under the socialist banner. When the whole system collapsed, there were so many state run laboratories who were using their sports stars, their athletes as guinea pigs for a higher and higher and higher variety of anabolic steroids which would improve their performance. In fact, uh, there is one lady from East, former East Germany. She took, she was a world record holder of something like three or four Olympics in succession. She won the gold medal in the women's athletes. And the kind of medicines which were given to her possibly by the state made her realize that she's actually changing her gender. Oh my that was God. kind of yeah it was it was pitiless merciless and they were all thinking about one thing only we have to show the world how we are a happy population so as such there is injustice as such there is no willingness to give up power and kalyuga adds a dollop of hypocrisy and now you have a fine mess so you, know, you don't even know when somebody is taking the banner of uh, like there is some population and somebody is writing article after article about the abuse done by a political party. Or you don't know whether this person is actually a warrior or he has been paid by someone to only focus on this particular thing and not some other particular thing. So to add to the mess that is today. There are people who say that, okay, this person will only speak about this particular thing, but not about climate change. Why? Well, because their thesis or grant could be in the hands of some multinational. Hmm. So it is a difficult subject to comprehend. Yes. At least there are two distinct points you made that if there is a a desire to appear successful, then the idea if somebody has the power of social engineering of being God, then they can they can do quite a, a lot of harm while appearing to do good and covering up the harm that is being done. They could do a lot of harm. And uh, another point I had is in mind was that when there is okay, both ways this virtue and vice which which are inherent human conditions. So rather than looking simply at uh, the social situation in which somebody is born and saying this is unfair and this is fair, we could also look at the psychological disposition with which a person is born. A psychological disposition, I mean, the combination of virtue and vice. Yeah. And that also is different for different people. And uh, that also results from one's past karma. I would like to talk about two distinct experiences I had. You know, when I travel abroad, I often meet different people and I've stayed with some devotees and some people who are extremely successful. So what I've observed is that so there's one devotee at whose place I stayed. He told me that he, he's a big doctor and he has six secretaries. And he says that his schedule is there are he works with six different hospitals and each hospital has its own secretary and he says his schedule is planned for at least six weeks in advance and if he has to attend one program he has to plan six weeks in advance right. so now and I, he actually showed me his schedule it is i would say it's, it's almost merciless <laughs> <laughs> it's almost every minute of the day right from waking up to sleeping is planned and he said if I don't get any sleep 
if i don't get enough sleep for any reason he is going from one hospital to another hospital he goes and sits in the parking lot and he says i take a 3 minute nap before going out of my, getting out of my uh, car and going to the next and it is he has to do surgery and stuff like that so the point is that when i saw his schedule and then i talk with him about now is, is this what you are doing exceptional he says no he says people who have my level of success everybody does that so you know there has to be a certain level of competence to be successful in society now even if we consider in the past there were kings or even when the aristocracy was there nobility was there some of them might have been wastrels but for anyone to be in a position of power and to maintain that some level of competence some level of commitment is required so the presumption yes. that those who are successful are so simply because they have because the system was rigged in their favor that actually doesn't do justice to the reality that they 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 are working they are working they have worked hard so that whether everybody if anybody who is given power like that whether anybody and everybody can do that that is something which is open to question so uh, for people who are successful and powerful they have certain amount of virtue and in our tradition there is the idea that if somebody is a king the king should be respected there's a story of prabhupad uh, where some devotees had gone to some circus and people were poking a tiger and making fun of it and some devotee also started doing that and prabhupad said no prabhupad quoted from the bhagavad gita that Ruganam Rugendroham. I think it was a lion, not a, uh, it was a tiger. Zoo. It was a zoo. The zoo, yeah. yeah. So I got a circus zoo, right? So then Prabhupada said that you know, this is that this animal is meant to be like a king. Don't humiliate him like that. And it's also there. Sanatan Goswami, when Nawab Singh Shah came to their place, they all got up to respect him. And the idea is that if somebody is a king right now, it the king could be brutal. but even if somebody is not having if somebody is in a particular position that position should be respected so that to be successful in the world it's not just because you are power hungry and you are exploitative but also you have to be competent that's one side of it any comments on this yeah uh, i feel very empowered when i uh access this particular piece of information from the vedas that power influence intelligence or cutting edge prowess success ability compare that with like a a big bank or a big ocean of ability and success and uh cutting edge intelligence and everything and if somebody comes with a spoon somebody else comes with a tumbler a third person comes with a bucket another one comes with a tanker they all will be given compared to the receptacle they have brought with them that would be made full so somebody with just a spoon will see that okay this he has given me one spoon full of water tumbler is a tumbler full of water bucket is a bucket full of water or a tanker is tanker full of water now whether somebody can swim in that spoon full of water absolutely not it is meager but meagerness on whose part you did not bring a proper receptacle otherwise the stock is there so nobility or being a king or all this kind of things the vedas tell that there is a huge unlimited stock god is the proprietor of that you do something to merit a higher position in your society you get that you abuse it it is taken away you use it it can be kept or increased or as a part of the justice thing somebody may say i don't need it now because i am no longer a king 
So somebody was born in a high lineage. He ruled like a king. He had enormous power. But because of the training and culture at a particular time, he said, now it's time for me to move into another state of mind, which should be another state of environment. So I cannot practice that while I am sitting on the throne. So voluntarily they relinquish that. So the moment people below understand that it is not this person who is ruling, but it is God who is ruling through this person. Hmm. So therefore the idea of calling a king Naradeva. He is Nara, he is not God. It doesn't become God. Unfortunately, today we find like uh, many dictators, they actually some crown themselves for life or fear that if I come down, I have no future in this country at all after that. My enemies will hound me and kill me basically. So in order to keep everything under sway, I remain. So as I was telling you that uh, they are removed either by death or by assassination. There is no third alternative for them. So when you have a when we have a system where the top leadership is so insecure, first of all, illiterate about wisdom and insecure emotionally, the situation will prevail. We will always have people uh, like they say about the Chinese history, say there is a Ming dynasty and there is Ming one, then his son and his grandson. Most probably the grandson, that means after 60 or 75 years of this particular family ruling, the grandson is a wastrel. So there is a farmer's son somewhere. He takes 200, 300 peasants. Then they band up. They go from village to village. They become 20,000 strong. The fourth Ming dynasty king is simply assassinated. And now this farmer's son says that from today onwards, equality, liberty, justice, fraternity for everybody. Because I know what hardship is. His son slips down a little bit. The third, fourth generation. So basically their whole history has been about 140 to 175 years of dynastic rule and everybody repeating the same pattern. Oh God. That means even if somebody is virtuous, afterward somebody comes up who is not that virtuous and then that person is throw overthrown. Yeah, so, so when you get that virtue, it's like uh, they say, if you have done tapasya, then you are at a particular stage. But if you have fulfilled your tapasya, and now you have the credentials. Now you don't have the maturity and the humility to carefully protect those credentials. You will be in a worse state because now you start offending others. Oh, okay. Like the so, Nahusha king who became Indra. Hmm. So Indra hood is good. You can enjoy the kingdom being the administrator of everything. But then he wanted the seven sages to actually take him on a palanquin. Yeah, that is uh, it is the height of the nadir of arrogance. So he to he was telling is... Sarpa, Sarpa. And they said, okay, if Sarpa is what you want, become a Sarpa. Mm. And he said that if I am Indra, that means Sachi also will be my queen. So Sachi was saying, well, you have deposed my husband, but that doesn't mean you obey, you own me also. He said, no, no, no. Once I come here, everything is mine. So this is used as an example of pride. It can also be used to show how and uh, why uh, mere virtue is not enough. You have to have a they say classical, I don't know if it is Maharashtrian folklore or Indian folklore, that uh, power is like tigress's blood. And you need a solid gold receptacle to collect it. Any other metal, and it will make a hole in it and will drain away. What, tigress what blood? Huh? Tigress's blood. Ah, sorry, oh. tigress's milk is... Okay. So... 
strong that you need a receptacle of solid gold so here tigress is milk how can somebody milk a tigress that means this person has to be very very valorous so he got the tigress's milk but then in order to gather it you need a receptacle of solid gold any other metal and it will will the uh, cause a hole in it so tapasya is the milk but humility of heart that is the receptacle that's a beautiful example let me try to understand this mm, it's quite a vivid example also tigress milk <laughs> <laughs> so the golden receptacle is that a person has to have uh, that level of maturity or that level of virtue and by tapasya yeah. you could also say that that is the effort that a person is putting either in the previous life or in this life also like tapasya gives you power but not the art of wielding it properly yeah okay that's that's interesting sometimes i say that for success there are three distinct components there is talent there is uh, commitment and there is temperament so now talent is say somebody is a somebody is just in cricket say for example somebody is extraordinary batsman they just they just very very talented but then commitment is where they are ready to practice put in the miles as they say work very hard but then beyond that there is temperament is uh, how do they function uh, in the tense moments or how do they function when they mm. get when they get uh, success do they become inflated and do they become so commitment is more of the hard work talent is more of what you have naturally got from a previous life but temperament is what you need to also cultivate yourself then the achievement yes. will be sustainable so you, we could put it in, in terms of your your metaphor the capacity to milk a tigress that could fall in the talent or the temperament but the yeah. the receptacle so that would be talent or the commitment you are working hard but you have to have the temperament to be able to do that we will to maintain that and that is the golden receptacle the golden receptacle krishna tested me by taking away everything from me the opportunity to have a center established in chasi to start initiating disciples students everything kind of failed and he said i didn't protest i passed the test and post 1967 krishna gave me so much success but i just handed it back everything to him and again i was successful beautiful so adversity uh, you could say reveals one's character and so does prosperity or adversity is a test of character and prosperity can also be a test of character both yes yes so this is a very beautiful note i think to conclude this discussion that Sure. we might be we might be in a position of uh, deprivation right now and certainly at a level of society changes do need to be made and we have for example in the past kings who would who would have system who would themselves give charity and who would have systems for giving charity but along with that we would also have the so charity was a very very important principle and uh, basically i read one very interesting insight about uh, the difference between charity and uh, government allotted uh, what you could call it dole or subsidy you know, whatever word you want to use subsidy yeah. or uh, government gives some support so what what the difference is that when an individual gives charity that actually leads to first of all the development of virtue in the heart of the individual mm. Mm. and it also develops a, some kind of connection between the giver and the receiver of charity mm. but when the state gives some endowment or uh, a state gives some uh, something to people then it doesn't lead to it is it's not leading to the sense of charity being developed rather people after where is the, after all where is the state going to give it from it's from the taxes that people have been given people have given yeah. to the country 
so at an individual level it can even lead to a sense of certain sense of hard heartedness you know that oh you are suffering the government is going to give you grants i paid my taxes for that purpose why should i give charity in advance in addition to that so the uh, so the you could say the institutionalization of welfare the institutionalization of social change can actually lead to the hardening of the human heart and uh, uh, then at the uh, so both you talked earlier about the entitlement mentality that if i have something i should be ready to renounce it because it doesn't belong to me so the the entitlement mentality can be there among the wealthy who feel that uh, this belongs to me but that entitlement mentality is avoided by spiritual understanding and the entitlement mentality can also be there among the poor within the system of social justice where they feel that, that the government has to give me these things and they don't work for it at all so that entitlement mentality can work both ways uh, to to harm the those who are in power and those who are out of power those who are disempowered so we need to avoid that and one of the best ways to do that is by spiritual understanding that actually whatever i have is not mine it is given to me for some time and let me use it as well as i can but if i have wealth if i have power let me use it uh, to create some kind of equitability uh, and to 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 help those who are who are deprived and if there is spiritual practice then of course spiritual practice will be entirely different subject but if there is spiritual wisdom and spiritual practice the spiritual wisdom can give us acceptance as well as some extent compassion and spiritual practice can actually transform people so that virtue can rise in their heart and vice can go down and then the whole yes. system can become sustainable so just just a last remark about yeah. uh, what could be the mentalities of somebody who is born poor born without any skills and he sees uh, somebody born talented born rich born powerful and uh, let us say a scenario where both of them are spiritually wise we began with the situation of the world where this is a sorely lacking thing but let us take a scenario where the upper class and the lower class both are spiritually endowed with wisdom because they follow an acharya so mm. the 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 lower class poor wretched poverty stricken or whatever they are empowered with the thought that i have done something to deserve this and this is the experience which i have to go through it is not a eternal situation it is temporary and, and all the help i get is from this upper class who only act as a conduit it is krishna who is giving me through them so then i pray to krishna let them prosper more and more and more now here it's a theoretical situation but i'm just saying that it is a possibility so now with the poor class they are actually praying for the prosperity of the upper class the upper class are happy that they are somebody is praying for my prosperity but they are also spiritually wise they know that tena taktena bunjita i just i can enjoy only my quota so there is example given in hindi folklore that for a rich person he is like in a boat and the wealth is the water around him and is very happy but what if he he sees a leak in the boat and water is rushing in so now he knows that this actually may cause me to drown so you don't take water in one palm and put it away put it out you take with both palms as much as possible so the admonition for the rich classes you have done something that why you are in a position you have these resources but these resources may drown you there is a reason why you have been given that your charity should be not with a 
palmful or a spoonful but with both palms so when you give something to a deserving person of the lower class you thank him for reducing your burden his role is to accept things given by you mm they are originally given to you by krishna so he is also performing his role so you eat like reasonably commensurate with your social position like it is it is understandable that somebody who serves uh, khichdi to 10000 people every day he may serve gulab jamuns and, and paneer sabji to his own children nothing wrong with that but he understands that everybody who partakes of my charity is also my well wisher so so this kind of maturity on both on the part of both classes where krishna consciousness is at the center point i have been deprived of something because something i did and i am not fretting and fuming and angry at anyone i am just working on it i have been given so much well i must have done something but now i have a bigger fear if this thing goes in my head i become arrogant tomorrow i may be at the receiving end of the same charitable foundation which i have started last year because both yeah <laughs> both states are temporary so this idea that either sufficiently endowed or deprived are basically a temporary material state and the spiritual solution has to be to go beyond them only then we can have a situation where uh, as you rightly said it could be sustainable yeah that's beautiful actually i think this whole discussion this is uh, how karma and the consciousness of karma and the consciousness of uh, bhakti or seva how it could permeate in and um, uh can takes the um, compassion to a higher level that's yeah. it's quite beautiful maybe in a next session we could uh, apply this whole discussion to the exist to the caste system and yeah. we could yeah. differentiate that from varna ashram as it was traditionally meant to be and so we could yeah. take it forward so sure. maybe i'll summarize please so we started basically three points you know, what is right about social justice what is deficient and how spirituality complements it so uh, the right thing is that we do see inequality in society some people are in terrible deprivation and they need to be helped and uh, merit the idea of meritocracy that if you just work hard you'll be succeeding you'll succeed that is not always true because for some people the obstacles are so much that just individual endeavor is not enough some social institutions for help are required so in that sense the idea of social arrangement for correcting injustice and uh, disparity is a uh, important point it's not just an individual effort uh, but now but the where it is deficient is that there is a default suspicion of hierarchy and that those who are deprived are virtuous and unfairly unfairly uh, deprived and those who are endowed those who are wealthy those who are powerful they have exploitatively done that hmm. uh, so so the the line that separates vice and virtue is simplistically drawn that those who are those who are victims and deprivers are are virtuous and those who are and the other, those who are powerful are vicious but it is in every human heart that line and the problem with this understanding is quite often that those who are powerful though they may be a so social engineering might social revolution might be done they might be overthrown but then whoever comes in power they will become they will um, they will do the same thing or their successors will do the same thing so we talked about the russian revolution and also the french revolution what yeah. happened therein and then uh, we discussed about that four quadrant diagram 
that if social there's no social justice and there's no spiritual wisdom then it is unbearable if there is social justice but there's no spiritual wisdom then it is unsustainable because somebody else will come and they will take over that power so then we talk about social justice and spiritual wisdom sorry there's there may be no social justice but there is spiritual wisdom so now by spiritual wisdom there are distinct aspects to it one is that the existing arrangement the existing social arrangement is a divine providence so if i accept it and live so the christian understanding is that if you live dutifully faithfully following jesus and everything then you will have a bright future life in heaven but why the system is unfair right now why am i poor that there's no explanation for that within christianity but if we took the take the understanding of the gita then where we are presently is determined by our past and this is there is a the difference between acceptance and resignation acceptance is where i am i accept resignation is i can't do anything about it and this is how i have to be forever that's not the idea so uh, if it is at this level at least re the religious insight the spiritual insights can help one gain acceptance of one situation the desirable is where there is both social wisdom, social justice and spiritual wisdom and for that what is vitally required is the is the cultivation of virtue whether it is in the people who are deprived or people who are uh, people who are powerful and in that connection we discussed how that uh, when nisha said that when god is removed either the individual becomes god or the state becomes god so yeah. capitalism and meritocracy are like the individual is god and communism and extreme version of social justice are that the state will be god but the state cannot foster virtue in people and the end result is that uh, instead of god some people become like devils so you give the example of a tiger tiger that a tiger's milk to be taken is a golden receptacle that means for somebody to have power they also need a heart that is pure enough to not get intoxicated by that power they need a temperament and the spiritual wisdom wherein wherein we understand that whatever i have is given to me by god and it is temporarily with me and i have to give it up sooner or later that understanding can ensure that one doesn't develop the entitlement mentality and then one can use things equitably and a, instead of having the state doing reform if it's the individuals doing it then it leads to individual bonding between the giver and the receiver of charity it also leads to the development of kindness and compassion in the heart if it's a system doing it then that doesn't happen so overall yes. spiritual understanding coupled with a charitable instinct that is the best way to actually correct the inequities in society any any points remaining no let's get over so we'll continue next time thank you very much yes. okay thank you, thank you.